Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for another edition of Texas Insider TV brought to you by Speedstream. I'm Jim Cardle. With the Commerce Department earlier this week revising its first quarter economic growth numbers down to 0.1%, Wall Street and the national bond markets are focused on what might be the remaining year's recovery, should there even be one. Mark Flaster, a founding principal with Sandler and O'Neill out of New York City, has been for 35 years an advisor of Texas banks and we're pleased to be able to visit today with Sandler and O'Neill's Mark Flaster. Yeah. Well, Mark, thanks for joining us. Um, it's, uh, I'm glad I was in Austin at a good time to catch the weather, which is always great, and, uh, and to have this opportunity to join you and talk about some things of interest. Get out of New York City there a little bit, but let's just jump right in. You've been down in South Texas uh, traveling the state with your bank clients, but as I mentioned, the Commerce Department just a day or two ago announced and revised downward, as you had predicted last time you were with us, that the economy was going sideways. It's announced an increase of 0.1%. Give us your analysis of where we are economically. Well, the, the first thing we have to discover is that if there any question or desire that this is a trend going lower, that we're, we're, we're not in a recovery. We are in a recovery mode. Um, however, uh, uh, nations, it might be, in essence, I guess, words, it might be. Um, there was a very harsh winter the, uh, um, in many areas of the country, but in, but in some areas of the country, uh, the, uh, uh, the activity level was still low without that. So the important thing is, is if you want to look into the, 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 what caused it, because the number doesn't say anything, but what caused it was basically we are in a deleveraging mode. It's typical of any downturn is that uh, the first thing people do is they don't go out and, and take on debt. They go out and they pay down debt. And uh, because of the way uh, the government with the Dodd-Frank and all these other rules have, have uh, re-sorted the, the banking equation, uh, a lot of, of the debt decline was not payoffs. It was just people, what they call st st uh, strategic defaults. They just walked away. In, in New York and uh, 14, I think, other states that have strategic, they have judicial default, you have to go to the court to bring a foreclosure, I mean, uh, judicial foreclosure, to bring foreclosure uh, against a, uh, a homeowner, um, those uh, court cases take years. Um, in New York and Florida, you're talking uh, any, somewhere around 1,500 days from the time of initiation of foreclosure to a, a time when you might be able to perfect it. So you've got people living in houses for years without paying their mortgage and uh, feeling very good about it. So what do they pay? They pay their credit card because they need that and they pay the car because they got to get around. But if, when you and I were growing up, uh, we're still growing up, aren't we? Yes, we One are. Second. But uh, uh, mortgage was like sacrosanct. It's the first thing that you paid your mortgage. You got that out of the way because we got to protect the house. Now people don't care. The house, you can, you can they, they, they say, they take the house, they take the house. It doesn't bother me. And if you look at the real estate markets, the rental market has improved and prices on rentals all over the country are up and up sharply. And we, because of, of environmental laws and, and uh, everywhere in the country, it's difficult to build. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money. Um, and the net result of that is that uh, the, there's a, a lack of, or well, let's say a, a low supply of rental housing. And uh, we have a very young population in our country that uh, uh, have seen what's happened recently. And they said, well, you know, I'm not sure a house is, is something I need. One, two, I don't see it as, as a wealth effect, something that's going to bring value to me in the future. And so I, I, I'll just rent. And, and they're very mobile, so the house ties you down. And they don't want to be in that. So they'll just rent, and, and that allows them the freedom to move where they want. Well, you, you raise a good point. Uh, there and part of your answer that the number itself really tells you nothing. I think if we break down inventories had been built up in the fourth quarter, now they've stayed even, which involves carrying costs for businesses. Uh, Obamacare could be a governing factor or a restriction. What do you see if, as a business uh, that might be uh, constraining them or what's their outlook for growing the economy. Well, we've had, uh, you know, companies are, are cash rich and uh, one of the problems, and even here in Texas with all the, mm -hmm. the, the, the focus on energy and tech, um, 
the companies still are reluctant to borrow. I even talk to any bank here in town or anywhere in the state, and they'll tell you that that lending money is difficult. Really, um, Frost reported their first quarter earnings. Um, uh, the, the lending uh, uh, loan volume was down, and um, there's two elements to that. One, uh, companies are unsure of what government policy is going to be. You got a government that does not have a plan. Now, when you say, "Well, is government supposed to have a plan?" Well, they're supposed to make legislation that has that tells you what it is. If it's going to say that when the, red, red, the, the light is red that you don't cross, and when the light is green you do. Now they have legislation that says, I'm not so sure I know what color the light is. Mm -hmm. So it's changing and, and, and I don't know what to do. I don't know if it's red or green. They, they haven't told me how I'm supposed to respond to this. So I'm doing business and I'm, I'm capturing what's around, but I'm not thinking about what I should be doing and, or could be doing. And so we see companies cutting back on their uh, expansion, they don't expand, and so if you have a company that is building plants for the f for, for bigger business and more expansion, and all of a sudden they say, well, we'll cut that back, we're not going to do that, uh, what happens to all that money, mm -hmm. okay? And all that expenditure of construction activity and people that we might hire, it just it, it sits there vacant, dormant, and it, it doesn't encourage anything to happen, and that puts a hole in our economy. Now, you talk about the, the, uh, the remember the third period last year, we had uh, Congress come in uh, uh, with their fight and they end up with the sequester business. Uh, everyone was concerned that that was going to tackle the economy. Instead, the third period, the, the GDP number was very big. And it was very big, it was up to close to 4%. And that reason was because in getting ready for this, companies started to stockpile, so they built a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they didn't, couldn't sell it, and nobody wanted it. So you had this engine that put it in the, in, in, out in the, in the yard, and no one came to the truck to pick it up and take it. And then, as I mentioned earlier here in, the, in our pre-discussion, which I think is important, is when Christmas came, which everyone thought was going to be a big, big uh, sales time, and we not only get rid of inventory, but we're able to raise prices in front of the, the Christmas holiday, because we, we do 40 or 50 or maybe 70 percent of our business at that time. Um, businesses found that the, the uh, stores were empty. People weren't shopping. The the big uh, Black Friday uh, was uh, was a miss. Didn't happen. And it didn't happen. And then they said, "Oh, it's going to be the weekend." So we we took like the the uh, movie people do. They no longer give you the figures for the for the for the opening day. They give you the figures for the the next six weeks and say, "Oh, it, it did fifty million dollars worth of sales." He said, "Well, okay, but they they they, they took all the what they could find and to come up with this number." So the the, uh, the the thing that's most interesting about this Christmas is that this, in my time, it was the first time that the U.S. actually experienced the attitude of the, the uh, consumer of deflationary expectations. And you've been doing it for 35 plus years. Absolutely. Yeah, so deflation, talk about that. Well, the, in, in deflation, which is one thing that Bernanke said he knew all about and didn't want, and, and want to avoid because he was a student of deflation, but he didn't learn anything, from, in my opinion, from what he did. And, in the deflation, which uh, Japan went through for uh, quite a period, may not be over, is that the consumer or business alike uh, postponed decisions on the expectation that there's going to be a cheaper opportunity mm -hmm. coming up. It could be immediate future, it could be out uh, further on. We had retail sales in which companies were cutting prices daily and trying to encourage uh, shoppers to come into their store, and the shopper said, well, why should I come today? Tomorrow will be cheaper. And so they waited up until that last day because they were going to buy the gift because they were, they were gift givers. So they, they had the list and they were going to punch the ticket and buy the items. And the stores had lots of, lots of inventory and uh, they just weren't selling and they kept on reducing prices. And we had a real deflationary cycle. Now, I mentioned to you, we have had, that was the second opportunity or second exposure of a deflationary cycle. That one we saw because it was recorded, and it, it came out in these in, uh, CPI figures that we've recently seen. The first one, they buried. We talked about the Bureau of Labor Statistics, mm -hmm. being there in the Commerce Department, putting new spins on things. Housing prices in this country dropped over 30 percent on average, in some communities over 50 percent, and nobody recorded it. And we're still digging out, communities are from... Yeah, but I'm saying that no one recorded it. So. The fact that the wealth effect was a very big def uh, deflationary, or, or let's say, uh, uh, what I say, a, 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 a con contracted 
we'll say the the uh, economic balloon took the air out of it. I would say use the inflate, inflation, mm -hmm. the inflating and deflating, not uh, mm -hmm. in price wise, but it it took all the opportunity for people to move. So here we have Texas, which is a great economy and a lovely article in the, in the newspaper early in the week, and you have people who said, you know, I'd like to go down there, but I can't get out of my house because the house is worth a lot less than the debt that they have burdened the house with, and and so they can't sell, and so they're stuck to stay where they are. Well, you mentioned Texas there in the Wall Street Journal article front page the other day on Austin in particular. Uh, in your analysis, with the national number coming out sideways, so to speak, to what extent is it discernible for you that Texas has been a leader and a driver in what little economic development there was. What do you see for Texas? Well, some of the people uh, here tell me that if it wasn't for the oil and gas business in Texas, that the the national figures of employment would be negative instead of positive. That a good piece of the employment a capture of, of job opportunities in, in Texas overwhelms everything else in the country. Now, if you look where the jobs are, they're in the in the uh, uh, in the energy states. They're in up in North Dakota in the Balkan fields. They're down you know, here in Texas. They're over in Louisiana, in uh, in the Mar in, in Pennsylvania, in in, in the Marcellus field, in the Utica field outside of of, of, uh, of uh, Ohio and, and and Western Pennsylvania. It's an absolute and, revolution we're going through now in the energy and, industry. And we are. And it's important to recognize that that the the the, the shift of environmental focus to, we'll say, green or non-polluting uh, uh, energy resources has actually been uh, uh, eviscerated by the, the founding of uh, natural gas supplies. So we have uh, become, a, we're going to become an energy exporter. Um, coal although the most uh, abundant resource in the whole world, you've taken it far afield when we started, but mm -hmm. coal, the most abundant resource in the world, is environmental nuclear waste. I mean, it's nuclear, you just can't touch it. So although we can, uh, uh, there are, are uh, processes to, let's we'll say, clean up coal, no one wants to touch it. And so we have huge resources all over the world of coal, and it's going to lay vacant. And in place for that is going to be natural gas. Now, natural gas is not only available here, the largest supplier of natural gas is Russia. So if you go, we'll take this farther afield and say, well, why isn't everyone jumping on the bandwagon and helping our president, you know, impose sanctions on, uh, on Putin and Russia and what they're doing in Ukraine? It's because Russia supplies gas to all of Northern Europe. And they say, hey, you know, I said, if I touch this, it's going to light up and I'm going to be the firecracker. And I don't want to get involved with that. So. You do what you want. I'm going to make sure I get my gas supplies. And and now we we're in a situation you're talking about natural gas, where ten years ago states like California were touting natural gas as a clean alternative for natural gas cars, lower energy pri uh, electric prices. Now that we ha have natural gas abundance, they're being critical and trying to shut it down because of other built up emergencies. So either way you go there, but back around on Texas if I can, uh, you've been advising banks now for 35 years in Texas. Do you see uh, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, is there any particular industry other than the oil and gas that may be worth mentioning? Well, of course, well, the, 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 uh, the, the, the knowledge base industries and uh, there is uh, uh, the, the housing construction, and, and here you can see the, the, the building construction here in, in uh, Austin. Um, and we did have the governor announce a Toyota and a Toyota, Toyota moved uh, their, their, uh, their, their headquarters, not just the plant, their headquarters to Plano, uh, going to bring in 4,000 jobs. Now, 4,000 jobs isn't 4,000 people. That's 4,000 families. So you're talking two to six, you know, people, new homes, and it's a bit very, very vibrant. Um, and, and there's more of that coming. The tax structure of Texas is very positive. Um, in, the, in other areas of the country, particularly 
the northeast and some of the mid-central areas where there's a very liberal government, uh, just can't find a way to stop raising taxes. They just say, we have to support these people, we, we need more revenue services, and guess what? We have people that make a lot of money, they can afford to pay it. And of course, the people who don't make very much money you know, are the, the majority of the population. They say, good idea, let's vote for that. And so we actually now have, I would say, a taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the people that have the, the most or have the most uh, available to them are, are very small relative to the population. And I think somebody wrote uh, in an op-ed page the other day, if you took the top 40%, the top 40% of wage earners, which takes you all the way down to like $50,000, and you took that, those people, and you took all their money, okay, which is going to take it, okay, you couldn't support the 60% that don't pay any taxes. Interesting. Folks, again, I want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Texas Insider TV. We're visiting with Mark Flaster, founding principal of Sandler & O'Neill out of New York City. Mark, one final question, because I know you've got a plane to catch, and you mentioned the majority or the quote-unquote average person. Now that we're looking at revised overall economic growth figures, the post-World War II average, uh, and the Fed target right now has been, I believe, 3% growth for 2014. Is 1% or 0% going to be the new normal? What winds of change do you see to, to get us off that low rate? Well, if you look at the, the quarterly numbers, there's a lot of volatility. Okay. So last year, the, for 2013, the, the GDP on a year-over-year -year basis grew at 1.9 percent. In November of 12, I have this in my brief, okay. in November of 12, the Fed gave their forecast for 2013. Okay. okay. It was four and a half percent. In two months later, they also they gave them a forecast every month of what they look forward to the year. Two months later, they were still at over four percent. Five months later, they were in the threes. Okay. On December, before the report came out for the last month of 2013, they were still in the twos, and the number was one nine. So. The Fed has no idea what they're doing. <laughs> they're trying to manage optimism, which is an important factor in the consumer's psyche. Well, that, that's, it's, it's all a spin. It's all a spin. And the problem, as we, we've talked about before, is that in every other recession this country has gone through in the post-war period, the, they were pretty much, they were business-led recessions, they were inventory-led recessions, lower interest rates were helpful for business to get, get uh, traction and get back on board and uh, liberal lending, uh, what I mean by that is that the banks were able to, to deploy funds as they saw fit. This okay. time around, we have uh, restrictions and restraints on our banking system. They're not allowed to lend. They have to keep a very st uh, larger capital components. Many of these rules have not been written completely yet, and so we're not sure what they are. We just saw what happened to Bank of America. In, uh, in or Citibank, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. was it Bank or Citibank? Mm -hmm. uh, Citibank. Citibank? One of the big ones. Citibank, and in, in, in they went through and put together the, the table of contents that they were asked to do, and there was an error, and so they had to then postpone or retract uh, information that they gave to the investor that they were being a stock buyer and they're going to pay dividends, and the government said, unless you pass this test, you can't do that, and uh, on the revision, they didn't pass the test. So the government is basically in there with a heart monitor you know, on one side they're chopping off the arms and legs, on the other side they're, they're testing themselves, are you still alive? And, mm -hmm. said, and, if, and if they reply to the arms, well, we haven't done enough yet. And so we're, we have the SEC, the state uh, attorney generals, uh, who are constantly suing all the banks, collecting tens of billions of dollars, it's up to $250 billion. We took $61 billion from Bank of America alone, and it's still counting. Mm -hmm. They haven't quit. And so, these things are all restraining the opportunity for the economy to, to get going. So, yes, we are in some kind of recovery. It's going forward. It's not going backwards. And, uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, keep, keep, we'll follow it along. We'll have you back here next month when you're making your Texas tour. And um, I'm not going to take the bait and get you st started on Dodd-Frank. That would be a whole show <laughs> in and of itself. So, Mark Flaster, thanks for coming by. Um, from San Leonardo O'Neill out of New York City, bank advisor for Texas's 
banks for 35 plus years. Folks, we appreciate you joining us for this edition of Texas Insider TV. Remember, you're either an insider or you're not. I'm Jim Cardle. Thanks for joining us. Okay.